Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today I'm going to talk about inductance in PC board layout specifically uh, along the lines of unwanted, unanticipated. When we're done, hopefully it's simply unwanted uh, inductance. And you may find out why PC boards like this are uh, kind of evil actually. Uh, there's something wrong here and you'll learn to spot it. So why talk about inductance? Well, it, it, it's a fact of life that inductive reactants, X sub L, means that all inductors have some form of resistance to it, not just the DC resistance that a piece of wire has, but also this makes a flux, turns it into an inductor, that's, that's an inductor, and uh, adds a frequency component to what we're trying to do. Now this can be nasty in power supply distribution and also in signal propagation, and so the trick is to make it turn it from being unanticipated to simply unwanted, and then we learn how to deal with it and we do things like gridding and stuff, making uh, alternate paths and reducing the, the, the inductance wherever we can. So um, at the beginning I showed you a small prototype board. Here's that small prototype board at the bottom. On the top's a bigger prototype board and this was $49 brand new from Vector and it still has the same issue that small board had at the bottom. So see if you can spot it. Go back, stop the film if you need to. Um, but we're going to talk about how to address that. Okay, let's get this conversation out of the way. I'm going to go fast. But often we have a shared ground path, and the resistance that is in that path creates a voltage drop. So if this guy is 1 amp uh, point, and there's 0.1 ohms, there's going to be 0.1 volt drop. And if this guy's a square wave, you're going to see a 0.1 volt drop that's a square wave. Now, if this guy shares that same path, and let's say he's only 0.1 amp, but he's got an entire ohm. There's actually going, that's going to all add together and we're going to get 0.2 volt drop. So 0.2 volt right off our noise margin, even before we get to the circuitry. And you can even reverse this. You can put the 1 amp guy down up here and the 0.1 amp down here. And the other guy, he, he, he shares the grief of his neighbor. So a real quick example about why resistance is bad uh, in our grounds and in our VCCs, and let's move on. Another name for this video could be three of my favorite books, and, and, and here is one of them. I'm going to be showing a lot of books today where I got this information from initially about high-speed design, which involves inductance. So uh, these data books for free. This one's from the 70s. This is the Motorola Meikle System Design Handbook. And I'm going to show you a chart from it about just copper resistance. Uh, but somebody once mentioned, you can tell you're old. You uh, say data book instead of data sheet. So here's a chart from the Meikle System Design Handbook, again from the 70s. I'm sure they knew this way before then. Uh, but it, it, if we look, here's a 20 mil trace. We see that it's 0.2 ohms per foot. So suddenly the example I showed, 0.1 ohms, hey, that's uh, 6 inches of a 20 mil trace. So what is inductance, and for that matter, what is capacitance? And, you know, I try to come up with some visual aids, and they, they just suck. I, I don't care for these. I was going to show how, see how the, uh, the, 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 mag, the flux interacts with each other, but you don't really get that. I'm just going to take this kind of thing and the, the little shiny stuff helps you imagine the flux and uh, you could even twist it together and see the flux becomes like canceled right and it's like screw that this this was kind of useful though and in that it helps demonstrate the left hand rule which is if you put your fingers in the direction of the that the flux travels your thumb points towards the north and uh actually you can if you have enough fingers which i'm missing one there um, you can determine uh, the, the E, the electro part of electromagnetic, and the magnetic. They're at right angles to each other. So the visual aid is good for almost nothing. So what is inductance? What is capacitance? Well, let's, let's try and talk about that. All right, simply put, a capacitor resists a change of voltage when it's in parallel to something. Uh, it acts like a mini battery. It stores electrons, and and doing so, the voltage it, it, it's fighting you as the voltage tries to change. So it acts as a low pass filter, and in series with something, a signal going through it, it acts as a high pass fat filter, meaning the high frequencies can get through, and direct current can at all. And I was lucky growing up, and in that I could visualize a capacitor easily, 
because they were in all the radios. There was something like this, sometimes huge ones, right? And it uses air as a dielectric, and when the plates are fully meshed, uh, the, the capacitance is maximum. You could get that. You could get why direct current can't go through this. There's no direct path unless it arcs over. Um, so I'll show you here real quick a, a, a quick example of just an LED, a resistor, and a capacitor, and uh, how it, you know, stores, it resists a change in voltage. All right, again, this is something you guys already know, but let's go over it real quick. Uh, here's a small tail and cap. It turns out the biggest capacitor I have around here is 47 microfarad. Can you believe that? In the old days, I, I had 10,000 microfarad caps laying around. And, and I could have lit this LED for a half a minute. But if you watch, I disconnect the battery and the charge drops slowly instead of instantaneously. I'm, first cycle is it charges this cap and then when I disconnect the battery it supplies the, it, it resists that change in voltage. I went from 9 to 0 and it's fighting me, right? And it's in doing so it's providing the current to keep the LED lit longer. What is an inductor? Inductance. It resists a change of current. It does that by storing energy in the flux that surrounds the conductor. All right. It also acts as a low pass filter if it's in series with something. So now growing up again, transistor radios were full of these. These are little coils and they're adjustable and it moves a little slug in and out and I know that because the slug would fall out when I was a kid when I over adjusted it and the radio was no good. Y'all probably know more from seeing these things like on cords, USB cords and whatnot, where they have this ferrite material. And these are acting simply as low pass filters to keep all the stuff that will make it fail FCC compliance testing, which means it won't screw up your TV signal and nearby radio wireless devices, radio devices, by putting a signal through a core. You can actually wipe wrap around the core or go through the material, either one. So here is an inductor, just not much of one, but you'll be surprised how much of an inductor that is, I think, before we're done. So it's obvious that that's a small inductor compared to something with coils. Now, I had a whole collection of, of coils with my grid dip meter, which I cannot find. It is with my neon light bulb that I was going to use to show you inductive kick. I'm sure it is. So, but it's easy to see that this has more inductance than this, right? And it's easy to imagine that that has even yet more inductance by putting a core in it, a place to store the flux, all right? So an inductor, when, when this is in place, the voltage is jumping up and down across this thing and being absorbed by the flux to prevent a change in current. If it's at 0.1 amps, it wants to stay at 0.1 amps and it's going to resist my, my attempts to change that. And let me show you a visual example of that. And this is the old inductive kick thing we always did in the first year of electronics class and everybody went ooh and ah. And uh, these days we're not as easily impressed, but let's do it anyways. So here I have a transformer just because I wanted the demonstration to actually work. I had one big transformer left uh, uh, that somebody had given me. These are hard to get to. In the old days, you walk to Radio Shack and, and load up with these things. I had boxes of them, all said stand core on them. Over here is a Nixie tube. And why a Nixie tube? Because I can't find my neon light bulbs, because they're just not used at these days. But the idea behind a Nixie tube and a neon tube are, are similar. Um, there's a gas in there uh, or, or a partial vacuum or whatnot where we it takes a certain voltage to ionize it. And I could sit here with a 9-volt battery and just the tube all day long and never get it to light up, spark, do anything. Now, I'm not using the transformer like you, you, you might be used to thinking like AC goes in and a higher voltage comes out. Well, this is DC, all right? So all I'm doing is I'm going to connect the battery. And by the way, this will knock you on your ass if you do it wrong. So don't do this, all right? 
right now there's a current going through the transformer and it's 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 steady it's probably discharging the battery at, at full width but watch what happens when I disconnect the battery this happens after matter of fact let me get it in there okay you saw it light that <laughs> actually arced I think but it was enough to set off a 170 volt operating voltage Nixie tube so what's going on well it said hey the current is falling the flux field is collapsing it's cutting across itself all kinds of things happening and it ups the voltage way high to keep that current flow going. So here it is again. There's no spark when I set up the current. The 9 volt battery is attached and I disconnected. And that time it was actually orange. Earlier when I was doing it, it looked more like an arc. <laughs> so I'm probably ruining the Nixie tube. But I was kind of proud of myself come finally finding a, a, a stand in for the neon tube, which I'm neon bulb which I'm sure I'll find later today. So that's, that's, that's a visual aid where we've got taught as youngsters that inductors really do do something uh, uh, in, by way of storing something because that happened after I removed the battery. So just to show you where inductance can hide, so we're starting to see that this is a real thing, right? It stores energy, it resists changes in current flow. Another one of my favorite books, uh, actually one of my favorite authors, this book's been redone and is available still through Amazon, this one, I, it's an old one, and it's by Henry Ott, and this is where we really cut our teeth on FCC uh, submission and, and passing FCC, and I could tell you stories about it, plus our own Chris Gamble and David Jones on the Amp Hour interviewed Mr. Ott, so uh, he's kind of one of my heroes and one of my three favorite books. So let me show you a, uh, a, a chart from inside the book. So remember, I said this thing's frequency sensitive, and uh, here's the chart. Gotta love charts, right? You don't have to do the math. But you can see that uh, as the frequency increases, the impedance of a one inch long trace, which was calculated to be 15 nanohenries, look at it, it's up to uh, 15 ohms at 160 meg, where it was 0.1 ohms at 1 meg. So here's the very real effect shown as in chart form that to, to get a fast rise time, and this is what it's all about, to get fast rise times, you have to have minimal impedance because the higher impedance it, it combined with the capacitance of what you're driving and stuff is going to slow down. It's going to act like a filter. So by now you're going, Bill, what's this have to do with PC board layout? Why would you take us the long way around? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I remember the moment this clicked for me for sure. And that is that this has more inductance than this. All right. You think, wait a minute. This is a more like a coil. I, I could have made it round, except I picked the wrong wire to bend. This stuff's tough. It's welding wire, well, welding rod. Um, but that's more representative of what you might get on a PC board. It's the area of the loop. As it gets bigger, it's more inductive. Well, you think, oh, how's this related to what's way over here? Well, the answer is, is during the time when they're close to each other, and this is why I almost started like with the visual aids, their fluxes are laying right on top of each other and they're counteracting. They're pushing and pulling, they're, they're collapsing and counter collapsing. And if you get these close enough and, and, and inductive enough between them, I don't want to say mutually inductive. That's for two different signal paths, not the same one. Um, but they cancel, and you end up with just the uh, the the same, the the, the self-inductance of a wire of the conductor. Here, this can't feel as easily the current flow in this way in the flux, and so it's it's self-inductance all the way around instead of just this part here. So if you don't believe me, we're going to my third favorite book, and I'll show you. But this is, once you get this, that that's worse than this. And that a power trace that goes around one side and then the ground trace goes around the other, around the edge, is worse than a power and ground trace to follow each other up to the chip or gridded. Right. So as I said, I remember when I got that, that the area of the supply path and the return path, as it got bigger, the inductance went up, the ability to do high frequency uh, signals goes down, but I didn't have the number or the math till I got this book. Right. And he 
I love this book in and that uh, there was a lot of arguments we'd had over the years where they were intuitive arguments. They were about proper ways to mix two kinds of grounds and, and stuff. And suddenly here in easy for me to understand form was the math for it. So let, let me show you that somebody else smarter than me, Dr. Howard Johnson, for example, of High Speed Digital Design, a Handbook of Black Magic, um, where he shows us that relationship between uh, area and inductance. So here it is that the inductance is equal to 5y, and here's x. So x and y is the area, and it's natural log, uh, plus the, uh, the inductor width figures in here. But quite simply, as y gets bigger, so the inductance goes up. And this is the area of the return path of, of inside the loop when we um, have power and ground return. And it continues to get bigger as x gets bigger, and it goes down a little bit as the trace width gets smaller. Because of this log function, uh, you could double your trace width and you only get like 15 or 20 percent reduction uh, in, your, in your overall inductance. So just going fat helps, but it doesn't quite fix it. And this leads us to this. This shows what was wrong with those PC boards I showed you earlier, where the ground comes up one side and comes almost all the way across, and the power comes up the other side and does, because the area is the entire board for the pack. This is called inter interdigitated because it does like digits do. It, 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 if I had enough digits, you'd see it. But that's what's on the PC board here, right? Even the expensive one is interdigitated. So given that inductance is a fact of life, as is resistance, and everything fighting us in the high-speed world, uh, we do have a toolbox with some tools in it to help us, and one I'm sure you're familiar with is the decoupling capacitor. And basically what you see is that you create a voltage source on this side of the inductance, or resistance and, and noise and crosstalk, all those things, but by having a capacitor close to your load, it can deliver an instantaneous, near instantaneous uh, charge and then it charges back up slowly. So it takes this high frequency domain and kind of moves it into a low frequency domain where it slowly charges and then delivers current for the spikes. Now, it's not perfect. There's actually inductance in the leads and capacitors themselves uh, have a self-resonant frequency and then there's a resistor in parallel because there's leakage. You know, I, I can't look at any component without seeing like, you know, the capacitance between the coils of an inductor, for example. Everything is very complex, depending on how far down you dig. So let, let me show you a, a chart that deals with the frequency aspect of decoupling. Here again from Mott's book, uh, it's actually the very next page, is he shows the impedance of various decoupling capacitors. It's an older book, so the, the, the capacitors are a little better than they were back then, the evolution of MLCCs and such, multi-layer ceramic capacitors. But you see that the, uh, the point at which they work and the frequency uh, varies by value of the capacitor. And what we used to do is do kind of a cascade. We'd have a 0.1 and a 0.01 because the 0.1 just couldn't get to those high frequencies in the older days. Now, now they can, but it, 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 what I want to show is that there's a frequency aspect even to our decoupling caps and their interaction with, uh, a, some, this is a, a 0 0.30 nano Henry of lead trace or, or trace on the board that it's interacting with. So another tool, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is the ground plane or power plane uh, in boards, especially as four layer type boards became more inexpensive we were able to dedicate layers to uh, ground or VCC. And in doing so, we lower the impedance because now it's not a 20 mil track, it's the entire plane is our ground and it's up to us to kind of keep it pure. Now, one of the things we used to do was to grid this because we were afraid of eddy currents swir swirling around in here and creating artifacts, right? And they do things in transformers because eddies are a real fact of life there. That's partially why there's lamination in transformers. The problem with the grid is we ended up getting crosstalk in some of the little segments depending on if two things were sh just by accident or by layout happen to share a common path in the grid 
uh, they could interact with each other. So we've pretty much gone back to solid planes. Now, one thing to know is that if this is a, uh, a signal trace, so I'm switching from power to signal now. If this is a signal and it's high frequency, the return path will try and follow it pretty close in the ground plane. So it goes out on the red and comes back on the blue. If it's a low frequency, it can mill around and whatnot. But if it's higher, high frequency, the higher the frequency, the closer that path will mirror that path of the, the signal itself. Well, as you see, this cut through an area where I had a connector, and it makes a slot. There is an aperture, right? Uh, a, 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 a place where there is no ground plane. Well, that means this return path, if I go ahead and put it up for you here, I'm using the purple to, to show the, the, the return path of a signal. You see it had to go around that space in the ground plane. So now I've suddenly I've got an inductor in one path and not in another. So you need to be aware of that. And see, this also does the same thing. This is where I just showed if you use a signal on the ground plane, you're creating this spot where the return path has to go around it as well. Now, there's another issue here too. The way these two ended up next to each other, guess what? When we're coupling these signals together with, wait for it, mutual inductance and resistance even. And so we're starting to go all the way back to our shared resistance thing I showed initially. And in this case, it can generate crosstalk from signal to signal. So when you're doing ground planes, just be aware of the place where you don't have ground planes. So the last graph of the day is I wanted to show you real life is real life. <laughs> it's just, it's complex. Uh, this is graphing just four components. You see all of their interactions create an impedance graph of this. This is going up in frequency. Here's a meg, here's 10 meg, 100 meg. And the interaction of the components, such as the inductance on the board, the capacitor, the decoupling capacitors we're adding. I mean, this isn't even taken into account, the, like the inductance of the decoupling caps leads and stuff, right? And just doing four components, uh, we, we find a place where things work really well. The impedance drops. We love low impedance power supplies. But in a different area of the spectrum, suddenly now we're up to like five ohms, six, seven, eight ohms of impedance. And you've already seen in, uh, earlier in this video that that's, that can be a lot. So this is very typical of what you'll see in real life is nothing's perfect. And there's a lot of complicated interactions all centered around impedance and are, um, are trying to nullify its worst problems it brings to the table. Okay, that was a lot of talking about inductance. I'm going to have to add a bunch of that out. So I'm not sure what all I'll make of it. If you remember nothing else that you didn't know at the beginning of this was that the larger the surface area, uh, the larger the area within the loop, the higher the inductance. I'm talking power and return or signal and return. The higher the inductance, the higher the impedance, and the higher the impedance, the more you're going to have to struggle to get those high speed signals through, and the dirtier your power supply is going to be. So hopefully that makes it through the editing session. Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Uh, catch me on the next one, and we'll do something fun, I promise. Or maybe not.